we're just so thankful that we have leaders that have asked for prayer. Lord, there's times when we don't know what to do, but Lord, may our eyes always be upon you. Lord, we're reminded of the story that the wheat and the tares, they grew together. Lord, there's people that are going to be affected and infected by this virus. Lord, we don't have to be scared of them. We, don't, we do not have to fear. Lord, I'm just asking that your hand of protection would be upon each and every one of us. Lord, those that come in contact with it and those that do not. Lord, that we would have wisdom to know what to do, how to react. But Lord, let us be calm and steady. Lord, let us be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Lord, we have got to act out our faith in a, in a, in a, daily, in a daily way. Lord, and I just pr- lift up our leaders. Lord, help them to make right decisions. Lord, that would be best for our country. Lord, help them to be calm and steady and know where their faith and their trust needs to be. Lord, I just lift them up. Lord, that the decisions they make, there's so many people that are watching them. So many people that are watching them. Lord, and I I believe for such a time as this, you're in control. We know you're in control. Lord, I pray that we would have sound leadership. Lord, the decisions they make would be great and, and, and be in the best interest of our country. But Lord, I pray that people would begin to see that there's no room for fear. There's no reason to fear. You're in control. We, we did not even know what the coronavirus was a month ago. And now it's on every newspaper. It's on every story. It should let us know how little in control we are. Lord, and without you, we're, we're lost. Lord, I pray that our eyes would be would turn to you like never before. Lord, if they're going to cancel things, Lord, give us family time. Let us spend time and enjoy the time with our family, not in fear, in enjoyment. Lord, that what was meant for evil would be turned to good. Lord, and that we would, our, our families would be united and would be stronger than ever. Lord, we would begin to rediscover each other. Lord, and to spend that time with each other and to appreciate and to love and to enjoy the time that we have with each other. We get so busy doing things. Sometimes the busy things need to be taken away. Lord, I, I pray that we will see your hand in this at some point. We may not know why. We may not know how. Lord, we know this. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. So right now, we don't have to know. But Lord, our eyes are upon you. And may our leader's eyes continually be upon you. Strengthen our families. Strengthen our nation. Give them wisdom. Lord, and and when we get on the other side of this, we'll look back and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for our relationship with you. We thank you for your word that you've put in us. Um, Lord, I thank you that there's no greater power in the universe in the name of Jesus. There's no greater power in the universe than the blood of Jesus. I know nothing that cleanses like the blood of Jesus. It forgives our sins, heals us of our iniquities, heals our sicknesses, and so, Lord, right now, we, you told us to go around and lay hands on the sick. And so this morning, Lord, by your word, we pray for all those that are sick. We ask we pray the blood of Jesus over them. We speak the name of Jesus. We declare that all sickness has to leave in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that during this time that, that all people would be drawn to you. I pray, Lord, that us as believers, as Pastor Bobby prayed, would would recognize our own weaknesses and our own dependence upon you and help us, Lord, to to draw closer to you, to recognize that we are totally dependent upon you even for our next breath. And I pray, Lord, for all those that have rejected you or haven't found you yet, that through this time of crisis they would be drawn to Jesus, that Jesus could save them and heal them that they could have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, we do pray for our nation, and we do pray for wisdom for the leaders. As individuals and as a nation, Lord, we are totally dependent upon you. And we pray, Lord, for you to heal our nation, that you would draw us again together. Lord, when I was in school, we, we said the Pledge of Allegiance. 
one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, it's my prayer that through this crisis, you will draw us together again as a nation. Make us one people, united, undivided, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Do we have any children in the house this morning? If there's any children, you may come forward now. Kaysen's going to lead us. Josh is second. Marcos is third. How about that? Brooke is fourth. Come on. We got five. Y'all ready? Father, in Jesus' name, we lift up the children to you. We pray, Lord, you would bless them. Fill them fresh and anew with your Holy Spirit this morning. Fill them fresh and anew with your word. Raise them up to be world changers in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, it is my honor this morning to get to introduce our guest speaker. He's really not guest. He's really family. Him and his wife have become... Robert, can you grab that and put it down here? He wants to be on the floor. He wants to be close to us where he can breathe on us. Hey, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, that's a good thing. Come on, it's not a bad thing. But, you know, years ago, I love the way God works. Uh, the kingdom of God is all about relationships. First, it's our relationship with him, and then it's our relationship with each other. And so years ago, I met a, a preacher, and, and he had some meetings at his homes with uh, invited other preachers and their wives. And a guy named Philip Baker was there and uh, fell in love with Philip at that meeting and and Philip always stayed in touch with me. And through my relationship with Philip Baker, he introduced me to Paul Trokel. Evidently, they were brothers back in the day, right? In fact, I think Philip was your youth pastor, right? At, at when, yeah, yeah. So he was, say that again. You was his youth pastor when he was a youth, okay. Then you became the pastor, and he became the youth pastor under you. And so they've had a relationship forever, and, uh, and I just treasure the relationships that God has brought into our lives through the years. And so y'all give a warm Trinity Family Church welcome to Brother Paul Trokel. Turn green. Glory to God. Well, it's so good to be with you. And, you know, I, of course, Pastor Marty and I are in contact with each other every year. But truth is, if, if I didn't see him for five years, the minute I saw him, there would be like no time had ever passed. And we wouldn't have to catch up because you just know people that are kindred spirit. And I love the way he pastors. I love the way he loves you. He and Mila, I love the way they love you. I love how real they are. Uh, I don't know. I have, I, I, I have a problem every now and then, just to be straight with you. I do. I do. I have a problem watching Christian TV sometimes. When I, when I hear a preacher preaching and I'm hearing ego, 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 that my monitor starts going off. And I think, you're fake, and I don't want to watch you. <laughs> and I'm sure not going to send you any money. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so I just like real. I like people that are real, that are not in it for themselves. And you've got pastors like that. Let's praise the Lord for that this morning. You should, uh, you should thank God every day. But... Uh, uh, I just thank the Lord, and, and, and uh, I want to do something a little bit different this morning. Uh, before, before I uh, get started, I've got a, a short video, and uh, the video is uh, uh, just two examples. We went across the nation of Tanzania. This is our 18th year in Tanzania, yeah. and uh, we had our greatest year yet. We graduated 103 on-campus students. 
we had, uh, we had made room for 80 students. That was our max, 80 students, and 104 showed up. We did not have beds for those people. We did not have food for those people. We did not have books for those people. They slept on a concrete floor for three weeks. For three weeks, they slept on a concrete floor until we could get beds made for them. And uh, so we had to trust God, and we ended up graduating 103. One went home during the break and married some hoochie mama. And he, he, didn't, he, he didn't come back. I don't know what she kept him from obeying God, but, or he messed up, either one. But, you know, it, 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 was an, it was our best year yet. Glory to God. And then we, went, we did a leadership seminar across the nation. And, and just to give you an example of the fruit of what we're seeing, one of these graduates is a 2011 graduate where we did the leadership seminar. In, since 2011, he started 37 new churches. And what you're going to see on this video is us dedicating one of those churches. And I didn't know that they dedicated the whole building to my relationship with him. I didn't know that. They put a plaque on the board. It was a little embarrassing, but it was quite sweet. I just didn't know they were going to do it. But anyway... And then another graduate, we, uh, he's on this video. He graduated in 2003, asked me, what, what do you see me as, Pastor? And I said, I see you as a man who will go and start churches in the worst places of Tanzania, the most demonic places, the most militant Islamic places. And the worst of all is when the most demonic places with witchcraft and the most Islamic places meet together. And you get a hybrid is what you get. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if you understand that in some religions, it's okay to do anything in the name of your God as long as it furthers the cause. So there are some belief systems like that. Lie, steal, murder, rape, it doesn't matter. If it furthers the, call, the cause of blank, it's, admiss it's admissible. And so that's where he started six churches Six churches. He's uprooted his family. He's moved. He's gone to the worst, worst places in the city. He started churches right there. And so this is a short little testimony. And then at the end, we loaded 3,000 Christmas bags for, for children, uh, poor children. And they made me do a little thing like I was passed out at the end. It's kind of funny. I wasn't really sleeping. But here's the video. Yep. Turn the sound up. There you go. That's the guy. He's a modern day apostle. For sure. I didn't know they were going to do this, but it is wonderful, and we are so honored. So tell him we are so honored. To me, she This is a leadership seminar. Those are leaders from all over the region, about 500. That's that region where it's so, so difficult. I'll tell you a story about that. She came and crawled up in my lap. I, I don't know why. So took a picture of her. You have to forgive the shirt there. <laughs> so we packed about 3,000 anyway. <laughs> 
All right, let's give the Lord praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do, turn with me to Psalms 91. I, I want to do something a little different. This is even before I preach what, what I'm going to preach, but I, I just want to turn to Psalms 91. And let's let the Word of God just blanket over our hearts, blanket over our souls. People say it, you're hearing it over and over in the church, you know, uh, fear not, fear not, fear not. The Bible says we're not supposed to fear, we're not supposed to fear. You know, uh, you, you can't do that unless you get in faith, right? That's, that's the problem with just telling people fear not. You're not giving them any tool to fear not with. You're not giving them any tool to fear not with. You just say, don't, don't be afraid. And now, if I just st stood up here and I announced to you, don't think about red, uh, juicy apples. Don't. Don't. I'm telling you, don't. Red, delicious, when you buy it, the juice go. Don't. What do you do? Okay. Right. Right now. So, but we could talk a lot about, oh, man. Sweet cantaloupes. He might eat cantaloupe lovers. Oh, yeah. How about watermelon lovers? Yeah. What's another favorite fruit? Honeydews, Honeydews strawberries. Israel what? Israel I've never heard of that. Oh, what are you saying? Israel melons. Israel melons. Like cantaloupes, but they're ten times sweeter. Yeah. Cantaloupe, but they're ten times sweeter. Oh, I love that. Oh, praise God. Anybody else? Somebody say, I, how about chocolate dipped strawberries? Come on, the best of both worlds. On the eighth day, God made chocolate and uh, air conditioning. All right, let me ask you this. Stop, look up at me. When we were going through all those different fruits, how many of you were battling thoughts with, uh, about red apples? You didn't even think about it. Why? We gave you something to replace it. So you can't just tell somebody, fear not. They have to have something to replace. And if you don't give them that equipment, all they're going to end up doing is thinking about what they don't need to think about, which makes you think about it. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. I got another story. Pastor Marty likes stories. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord... He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous, perilous pestilence. Uh, some translations go out to say incurable disease. Pestilence. It's not talking about, uh, you know, it's not talking about insects or critters. It's talking about a, a disease that you don't have any, any knowledge of and, and, and comes from the side, and there's no cure for. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Okay? Because his truth shall be your shield and buckler, you will not be afraid. But his truth has to be your shield and buckler before you cannot be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence, again, that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. How many believe that's pretty much got it covered? Everything bad that can happen to you by any means and at any time of day. Amen? Amen? Now, this is where I want to stop and tell my story. A thousand may fall at your side. Everybody look at me. At my side. Right here. And 10,000 at your right hand. What we shake hands with? Oh, it's interesting, doesn't it? So I had a friend of mine many years ago. He's going through the bush in an open-faced Jeep, top with a t no top Jeep, with a great missionary named Ralph Hagemeyer. Mark Hankins was, was, was traveling with him. And Ralph 
was a lifetime missionary, so he, he, he drove fast through the bush on a regular basis. Now, fast in Tanzania bush is 40, 45 miles per hour. That's 120 on these highways. You're going 45 in the African bush, you're flying. And they're on a trail wide enough for the Jeep, and they round a corner in the bushes, and there is a herd of elephants feeding on bushes beside the trail. And Ralph just goes to work in that Jeep, slinging it right and left. He's weaving in between elephants. And, and Mark says they, they were headed for the back leg of a bull, one of the biggest bulls in the bunch, and he thought, this is it. You don't hit a bull elephant in a small open-faced Jeep and live. Because you hit the elephant, you're not, it's going to kill you. Uh, to him, it's just a bump in the leg. And then after that, if you land on the ground out there amongst them, they're going to trample you to death. So, you know, on his side of the vehicle is where the bull was. And so Ralph just kind of leaned over toward that bull, and the last minute he, he pulled it back, you know. So they get just as, you know, picking with Mark. So they got out the other side, and Mark's scared to death. You know, he's like this. And Ralph was driving, and he's laughing. He said, Mark, you think that was close? He said, yeah, that was close. He liked to kill us. He said, Mark, wasn't even close. He said, I noticed the bull was on my side of the Jeep, not your side. He said, doesn't matter, Mark. The Bible says a thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. According to the Bible, even if it's at your right hand, it still ain't even close. Right? So according to the Bible, if 10,000 people drop dead of the coronavirus, according to the Bible, if 10,000 people drop dead at my right hand, it's not even close to me. That's pretty strong. I said, that's pretty strong. Everybody's staying away from everybody, and the Bible says 10,000 drop right by your side. It's not even close. I'm not advocating, I'm not advocating walking up and, and sneezing in somebody's face. I'm not talking about being stupid. I'm just saying there, you can't not fear unless you have something else in place. A thousand may fall at your right hand and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and, and see the reward of the wicked. Because you made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any pl plague come near your dwelling. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up least you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the crow, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he's known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I, with long life. Come on somebody. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, if you don't know the, tech, the, the, the technical things about this, uh, this chapter, it's a, a person talking back and forth with God. And some theologians say that even in verse 9, different members of the Godhead get involved. I won't go into that, but it's a, it's a great, it's a great uh, chapter. Can you say amen? amen? And I plan on fear not. Why? Because I'm in faith. Hallelujah. Now, this year started off really bad. Really, 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 really bad. January will go down in history as the worst month of my whole life. Uh, almost uh, easily, easily, easily. I did something. I tore something in a disc uh, on my lower back, and, and that caused that uh, part of my body to collapse and pinch down on a, on a sciatic nerve. And uh, so December 31st, that happened. 
I didn't feel it when it happened until we went to church that night. And that's when, when the pain hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. Uh, and I never felt anything like that. In fact, the only thing, when I finally got into the doctor, he admitted, he admitted me immediately into the hospital. I hadn't slept in three days. You know, I don't know if you've ever gone three whole days without sleep. But it almost gets to the point where the no sleep is as bad as the pain. Because you're delirious by then. You're really goofy. And uh, there's nothing that I could take that touched it. There's nothing that uh, uh, that night uh, a nurse came in and she had got permission and she saw what pain I was in. And she told me, I'm fixing to fix you up. I said, what you going to do? I was sitting in a, a layback chair because the hospital bed's worthless. And uh, she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot you up with straight morphine. I said, how long before I feel anything? She said, oh, honey. Immediately when I push this, push this syringe, you're going to feel it. I said, well, bring it on. So she, she, hooked, she hooked up that morphine, and she, she pushed it in, and I'm sitting there looking at her thinking, okay, all right, all right, <laughs> all right, nothing's happening. <laughs> so she looked at me, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I, I'm waiting for this to kick in. She said, where's your pain at? I said, it's at a nine. And, you know, 10's falling on the floor screaming. So that stumped her pretty bad. So she called the doctor and she said, well, we got something here. And uh, he hasn't slept in three days. Can we give him a sleeping pill? And the doctor called back and said, absolutely not. That morphine's going to knock him straight out, flat out. So she came back in and told me, in 20 minutes, you're going to be flat out. I'm going to come back and see you. I said, all right. So she came back 20 minutes and I was sitting there. How you doing? <laughs> Where's your pain? I said, it's at a nine. Same as when you left, same as before you shot that morphine in me. She said, well, I, I've, I've not seen this. I said, okay. She said, legally, I cannot give you another dose until an hour and 30 minutes. But an hour and 30 minutes c comes by, I'm going to give you another shot of morphine. And I think she cheated because she filled that thing up. I mean, she had it filled up, so... Second round of morphine, 15 seconds later, I actually felt something kick in. And I passed out. I passed completely out. I hadn't slept in three days. I slept for four hours, and after four hours, the pain woke me back up. So it was, you know, it may know what I'm talking about, sciatic, nerve pain. Pain on, it's, it, I, I never felt anything like that. Now, what, what happened to me in the next few weeks of being, uh, I haven't moved into a separate bedroom and being, uh, really being up all night, you know, where you're just, you're going long, long periods of time with, you, you, can't, you can't find any way to get that's comfortable. So you can't, you can't, you're sleeping, you know, 10, 15 minutes here or there. That's just when you pass out from exhaustion. So I went through a, I went through a spell. I went through a test, you know. I don't know if you've ever, been in such intense pain where you actually said to the Lord, where are you? Where are you? I, you? You feel like you're a million miles away from me right now. I don't feel your presence. I don't feel your care and I don't feel your love. I don't feel your heat. I don't feel, there's nothing that I feel except this pain. Where are you? Where are you? And, uh, you know, I'm a minister. I've ministered to people about going through hard times all my life. And so now it's time, you know, for me to practice what I'm preaching. Which I always tell people, when you're going through something, the first thing you've got to get over is your tendency to, 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 to blame God. Or in some way accuse God of not doing something right. You know, Adam gets caught in his sin. And what does he say? The woman you gave me. Let's just get this straight. This all started because you gave me a defective product. It's human nature. It's the fallen nature you know, it's what's happening in politics right now. Somebody's looking for somebody to blame. 
as though there is a person to blame. So, okay, I got to get past that. I'm up on my, I know you don't want this image, but this truth, I'm up on my knees and elbows in my bed. I, I can't get any, there's no position to get. And water is involuntarily coming out of my eyes. Have you ever hit your finger with a hammer and had that happen? You're not boohooing. Your, your, your body's leaking. It, it's your body's way of saying, I can't take this. And water comes out. So I'm sitting there, and you know what happened? That song. Even when I don't see it, he's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. Now, what I discovered was easiest, easiest thing in the world to, you know, great voice and the keyboard player, and you come to church and you've got no problems, and she starts singing it. Ooh, even when I don't see it, yeah. You ain't. Ain't nothing hurting. You got money in the bank. You and mama getting along, and you say, oh, yeah, I love that song. Even when I. It's another thing when you're laying on your bed night after night with no sleep and that pain is like a drill in your brain and you feel like God has forsaken you and you start singing, not singing, just really thinking I couldn't sing. I'd hate to think what it would sound like if I sang at that moment. So I... I started, and, and then I, I got to that, you know, like I say, listen to your own preaching, preacher, which I preached for years, that if you'll learn to ask God intelligent questions, he will talk to you. If you would learn, if we would learn to say to the Holy Spirit, what is it you're wanting to, I got so deep in pain that I cried out to God and I said, Tell me anything. Just talk to me. Tell me anything you want to tell me about what I'm going through. And I started hearing the Lord talk about not wasting your pain. What an interesting thing to say. <laughs> you mean don't waste my pain? What do you mean don't waste my pain? You know, most people, they get, get through pain and the only thing they learned is, I don't want to feel that ever again. <laughs> but you know what I found out is that God, God will do something in your life. If you will ask the right questions at the right time about God, He will talk to you about whatever you're going through. And He will find a way to redeem Whatever you're going through. And I want to talk to you about that in a little bit different way. The three, the, the three different stages of redemption and, and pain. And let's turn to Luke 10. Three different stages. Luke 10. Don't waste your pain. Everybody say, don't waste your pain. Luke 10, verse 30, then Jesus answered and said, a certain man. Everybody say a certain man. Okay. Went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, what, what I want to say is, I mean, your ears are open, your eyes are open, you're hurting, you'll, Im you'll immediately start hearing and seeing things from the Word of God that you've never heard or thought of before. And so in this story, it says a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. What I want to say about this man is he's living an intentional life. He has a plan. He's not walking by chance through life. He has a plan for the direction that he's going. This is a certain man with a certain direction in his life. He's not living life by chance. And then it says, 
this, he met this, he fell among thieves, stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, now by chance, everybody say by chance, this is a man who's not living a purposeful life. He's not living a life that's divinely directed. In other words, he's not purposely going about his life seeking somebody that he might help. He's not purposely looking for anybody that's hurting. He's not purposely on a mission to bring healing to anybody. He has his life. And he's doing what he wants. So his life is really a life that's being lived by chance. It's not by divine decree. It's not by divine direction. Yes, he's got his own plan of what he wants, but it's a, that life is a life of chance. It's not a life of divine intention. He by chance is walking down a road. When he saw him, he he passed by on the other side. Which is the opposite of empathy. He is detached. Notice this. He is living a life by chance that is detached from other people people's pain he's living now stop and think about this this is a moral guy this is a religious guy this is a guy that represents God and the things of God but look at how he's living his life maybe he's going to the synagogue I don't know but he's too busy to be stopped by anybody else's pain He's too busy to be inconvenienced by anybody else's pain. Now, this is what's happened to me. This is what's happened to me. I can sit outside of Walmart right now in my car, and I can, I can almost tell you, and I, I'm telling you, I, I would almost not miss it. By the people that walk in and walk out, I can almost tell you who's in back pain by how they're walking. You know what? I notice how people walk now. I didn't notice that before. I learned that through Debbie. Debbie's got a bionic hip. Praise the Lord. She got a new hip. She's a bionic woman. Fixing to get two new knees. And we can be anywhere, and she'll she'll say that woman she's got a hip problem. I'm looking at her, she looks like she's walking normal to me, but not to Debbie. Why? She's got empathy. Empathy is your ability to put yourself in another person's shoes and feel their pain. The ability to put yourself in another person's situation and feel pain. Empathy is your pain in my heart. Empathy is your pain in my heart. So that's the first first thing because listen... Listen, everybody listen. All of you young people listen. Life is pain. I'm not trying to pronounce anything bad on you. I'm just saying in the future, you're going to experience pain. We're in a messed up world full of messed up people and somebody at some point is going to hurt you. It's not a bad confession. It's pretty much... Stop and think about it. The first... People that got married, okay, their marriage got out of divine order. Adam didn't speak up. He didn't take responsibility. His lack of taking his place allowed the enemy into the garden that that brought them out of fellowship with God. Then those two people had two sons, and the first family, the oldest son, murders. How many believe that's dysfunction? How how long out the gate were they before pain ensued? It was immediate. Can you say amen? Amen. 
So life is pain. It, 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 there's a lot of... It's, but for the, for, the, for the Christian, God is able to redeem every form of pain you've ever been through. He's, he's able to make it a redeemable situation. But the first is, if you're going through it, you might as well learn something. And that is the ability to spot other people in pain. And be moved. Be moved by it. Now this guy's not moved. Not only is he not moved. <laughs> look, no, Notice this. <laughs> he moves his life away from hurting people. Not only does he not go where the guy is. He goes away from him. He avoids him. He passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite. When he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. So this guy, th these are both religious representatives and, and, and none of them have any empathy whatsoever. Can you give me that stool? Could you do that? But a, a certain Samaritan, everybody say certain. As he journeyed, came where he was. Notice this. This is an intentional life. Can you say amen? amen? This is an intentional life. When a person is filled with empathy for other people that are hurting, their lives become divinely directed. You move like a magnet toward hurting people. Come on now. Come on now. I know, I mean... It's just my opinion, you know, that all this separation and moving away from each other, I don't like it that much. I think it's a little bit overreacting. That's my opinion. It doesn't mean that I'm right. It's just my opinion. But it's like, you know, get away from each other. You ever stop and think about that? Believers will lay hands on the? Believers will lay hands on the? Okay. Are some of those, could some of those sick? That Jesus said, lay hands on, be contagious. He doesn't say, he doesn't say, if, now look, if you're a believer and you're going to lay hands on, a sick, on the sick, do it with a baseball glove to keep you from getting, because you don't want to, you know. I believe it's included in that package that I'm going to lay hands on you and not make you sick. Not only am I not going to make you sick, I'm not going to sick, get sick. And dad gummit, you're going to get better. Amen. How you like that Louisiana cussing there, dad gummit? Okay? Louisiana cussing. I just want to show you this. Notice this. What, what, how, can, how can we not waste our pain? If God wants to do a work in your life with everything that ever hurts you, he wants to redeem it. He wants to make a testimony out of it. Come on, somebody. He can do it. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Notice, he's got a plan but where, where he wants to go. But because of his ability to be empathetic, his plans can change at any time. Can we say that about our lives? My life can be inconvenienced at any time for Jesus. I'm willing for my life to be inconvenienced at any time because I'm living a life that's on purpose. As I follow the plan of God, don't be surprised if it takes a sidetrack and that sidetrack is still ordained by God. I'm on a journey but I've got time for people. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. I've got time for people. People don't have time for people anymore. And when he saw him, notice this. Empathy, empathy 
took him work to where he was. But when he got a close-up look, something deeper happened. He was, he had compassion. Compassion is, is love in action. Compassion is love that goes beyond feeling. Love that is energized to do something. To, to bring healing, to bring uh, uh, comfort, to bring restitution, restoration. It, it, it can't help itself. It can't help itself. Come on. It cannot help itself. There's a Lord. Our, our, our daughter just came and, and, and brought our granddaughter who cried all night. For about three nights. Yeah, I know I'm live. Love you, Abby. Love Cora. Love, love you. Love you. Love you. Come, come back. You know. Just, just not, keep, now. not right now, but no, no, no. I'm just joking. I'm just. Now you know. Okay. So my wife is is getting up and and uh, she she's wrestling that baby all night. You know, I love my granddaughter, but at some point, as a, as a man, I'm just going to put you in the bed, and if we're going to be miserable anyway, <laughs> let you be miserable on the other side of the house, and, and, and I be miserable in my own bed. See? But Debbie can't do that. Compassion in, in a grandma. Compassion. She's, she's, a, oh, she's the, oh, she's, she's, uh, I, as a grandfather, I'm not trying to sort out what's wrong with her. I want her to shut up. I want her to stop. Just stop. Just, dear God, put something in it. Make it stop. No, 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 De- Debbie's going through a process of, of, what can I do? What can we do? What, what's, what, What's wrong, sweetheart? What, what's hurting you? What's bothering you? Let, let, let B.B. fix it. B.B.'s Swahili for grandmother. She's B.B. But she, she's, and she's 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, and, 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 I, and, I, and, and I, no, I, I can't. Listen, I came from the other side of the house, and I, and, and I opened the door, and before I opened the door, I said, Dear God, please, don't let, don't let her say yes, because I opened the door, and I said, And Debbie goes, no. And I go, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> At least I'm off the hook, you know. At least I'm off the hook. You know, I did my husband. Th- Is there anything I, no. <laughs> Dear God. All right. Praise the Lord. Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew 9, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And he healed them. There's something that has to go beyond empathy, has to go beyond compassion, has to go beyond you. You've got to move. To, you've got to move your life to do something. To bring some sort of solution. And, and, and the world is full of hurting people. And we are the agents for every hurt and every pain. Why? There's nothing that's happened to you that hadn't happened to somebody else. Having crazy parents. Amen? Amen. I had crazy parents. They never should have been, they never should have married. They never should have married. They only, they only married because my mother lied and said she was pregnant when she wasn't. And she only lied to get my dad to marry her because of her father abusing her. She had to get out of the house. The whole thing started off on a lie. So they're together and they don't know anything. And, they're, 
And then all of that dysfunction in her childhood came out in horrible pain that split her personality, made her paranoid schizophrenic. She tried to kill herself four times. She had to be institutionalized three times. She tried to kill my father. My father tried to murder my brother. I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. They tried to kill, they, they tried to kill each other. Not, not maim each other. You understand? They tried to end each other's life. And that's all the while of addiction to over-the-counter drugs, addiction to alcohol, addiction to pornography, and we're going to church three times a week. So I can tell you this. It does, I don't know that I'm normal, but I'm somewhat functional. <laughs> I don't know that I'm normal. But I can tell you this, I've loved the same woman for 38 years. I've never cheated on her. We love each other. We don't always like each other. But we love each other. We got three kids. You know what? All three of our kids love Jesus. All three of our kids love us, love Jesus, and love each other. Except Abby, maybe after she sees this. So number one, let's say, everybody say empathy. empathy. Number two is compassion. compassion. Number three, moving. moving. Your life has to move. You, what, whatever compassion you're feeling, it needs to be moved to do, to do something. Do something. My wife cannot sit there with a, sleep, with a crying baby. It, she's going to be moved. And she's not, she's not, you know, she's not like me. I'll get up because I'm, I just want the baby to shut up. And I'll grab her and walk her around a little bit in hopes that it will do something. But the whole time I'm just sitting there thinking, when can I get back in bed? <laughs> this is driving me crazy. I'm just being honest with y'all. I'm just a man. Come on, I'm being honest with y'all. I don't, you know, I've never breastfed. I don't know all the feelings that go along with being that intimate. I just want it to stop. <laughs> now, what I, want, what I want to say about some of this is this. The only way to overcome a wrong spirit is with an opposite spirit. Right now in the world, we have an oversensitive spirit going on where everybody is offended by everything. Everybody is offended by everything. So when I'm talking about redeeming pain, I'm talking about real pain. I'm not talking about sister so-and-so didn't speak to me last week and I'm not coming back to church. That's, that's pain you're experiencing because you're acting like a baby. Pastor Marty di didn't, I was in, I missed three weeks of church and he didn't know I was in the hospital and, 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 you know, you didn't tell anybody, but you want him to supernaturally know that you're in the hospital. And you're offended at Pastor Marty because he didn't come see you. That's not real pain. That's you being in pain because you're a baby. I told sister, I told her how pretty her hair. She never says nothing about my dress or my hair. And I tell you, I, I'm not going to compliment her anymore. That's not real pain. That's the spirit that's in this world creeping into the church. Now, the only way to overcome a spirit is by an opposite spirit. You know what we do need to do? We do need to be overly sensitive. We need to be overly sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We need to be oversensitive to the Holy Spirit. And you know what He'll do? He will alert us to see where other people are hurting where we didn't see it before. Where we walked right by it. And you know what? Nowadays, I don't walk by it so fast. I was in a restaurant the other day and I went to go to pay. And there was a, the, a, 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 an older black lady. She was paying. And when she put her money down on the counter, she went, hmm, like that. And I just, I don't know why I said it like this. I said, what's the matter, mama? She said, oh, I fell last week and I've been in so much pain. I said, I got something for it. She said, what is it? 
I reached over and put my hand. I said, in the name of Jesus. I hit her back with my hand, and the healing power of God hit her body. She threw her keys on the counter and threw up both hands. She said, oh, I feel that. I was right in the middle. There's a line of people behind us. Guess what? I don't care. I don't care. I'm more sensitive to her pain than what other, anybody else feels about what I, being offended about what I just did. I don't care about what you think. I care about her pain. Everybody say empathy. empathy. Compassion. Compassion. Moving. God can redeem anything you've gone through now. Now, I'm going to get a little stickier here. Maybe might surprise some of you. You know what the Lord challenged me? My mother was a drug addict. My brother d- destroyed his life being a drug addict. He actually overdosed and killed himself. So I have a disdain for that. I have a strong dislike for that. But while I was hurting, I felt the Lord, I felt the Lord challenge me and say to me, what would you do right now for a pill that would stop everything? What would you be willing to do, Paul? Would you be willing to bend the law a little bit for someone to hand you a pill and make everything go away? You know what I had to answer? Yeah. This type of pain? What would you be willing to pay? Anything I had. Just to make it stop. Just make it stop. So now, when I look at people and I know they're strung out on something, I don't feel the same way anymore. I don't look at them and say, you're such a loser. Why have you let yourself get in this state? Why have you allowed? Why are you so weak? Why can't you get control? I can't do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to look down my nose at people that are suffering like that anymore. God forgive me for ever thinking like that or feeling like that. Even my own family thinking about that for years, thinking, why why do you have to be that way? Why do you have to bring this pain? Why do you got to make your pain our pain? Listen to how displeasing that is to be that way. I don't want to be that way. I'm not going to be that way anymore. If I see somebody and I know, you can spot the signs. Go up there and just say to them, you don't know me, but... Can I pray for you? Can I just just say that? Can I pr- can I pray for you? You know, I found out a lot of people that are hu- that are hurting. They'll let you pray for them. So I want to end this service, and I know it's not politically correct. And truthfully, I grabbed this stool to keep from passing out because I've been feeling just an attack on my life while I've been preaching this to keep me from passing out. I hadn't eaten much this morning. But let me tell you what's been happening. I've been praying for sick people and they've been getting healed while I was hurting. I've been laying hands on people. Can you bring this? That are emotionally distraught over something in their life. Now, What I promise this morning to do is I won't lay hands on you skin to skin. I'll lay hands on your shoulder. But if you're in pain of any kind and you want to say to, now if it's emotional pain, this is what I want you to do. I want you to yield to the healer this morning and not the pain. Sometimes when you lay hands on people, they just, oh, it's bad, it's so bad, do something, God. No, 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 no. We're not asking God to heal us. 
we're receiving what is already paid for. I need to put this, pull this up beside me where I can grab it. I want to give the devil a black eye. If that's you this morning, let's everybody stand up. Pastor, come up and stand beside me. We're not going to take a long time. I'm going to lay hands on your clothes. If you want prayer and you're not afraid of catching the, anything from me,